All right, thanks everyone. Hopefully we had a refreshing break. We'd like to get started again here. All right. Thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, we're going to keep going now. We're kind of into our uh, IPv6 afternoon, as it were. The first talk um, is going to be Beyond the Tipping Point, Global Connectivity, three years after World IPv6 launch. So I'd like to invite uh, Kevin Swift from LACNIC up to uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with IPv6 since the launch. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Kevin Swift, the Extended Relations Officer for the Caribbean from LACNIC. And you have heard throughout the day, LACNIC is one of the five RIRs there in the world. And in terms of service to the Caribbean, uh, quite often we speak about what is the Caribbean. LACNIC's Caribbean is basically anywhere between 11 to 14 territories, depending on how you look at it. And when I say 11 to 14 territories, for instance, we have Trinidad and Tobago, the Guyanas, Belize. We also have all of the Dutch-speaking uh, territories um, that are part of the Netherlands. And we also have Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. So that makes for an interesting part of the Caribbean compared to a lot of the other discussions where we usually look at the Commonwealth Caribbean, or what CARICOM looks like, etc. But Today, I'm going to just focus a bit about this transition between IPv4 to IPv6, what it means. And I pre prepared a very broad presentation just to simplify some things, to break down some of the concepts that we've been hearing and seeing. Uh, actually, uh, my colleague back at the office, Carlos Martinez, who's our chief technology officer, uh, he, Carlos was supposed to come, but he couldn't have made it, so he sends his apologies to everyone. So IBV6 comes to an end. Um, what we'll look at next is just a short video. It's very short, it's two minutes uh, just about. Um, that gives you a nice little summary of what we're looking at. Volume. As time has gone on, more and more devices have shown up on that. They do have so the internet was designed in 1973 and launched in 1983. And in that time frame, we thought it was an experiment. So we allocated address space, so we might tell you, sufficient to define 4.3 billion termination points on the internet. Now I can tell you in 1983 that seemed like it was forever, but we never think it was an experiment. The thing is that the experiment never ended. In 1996, we designed a different format for internet packets called IP version 6. It has 128 bits of address space. Translating that, it's 3.4 times 10 to the 38 addresses. Okay, I'll translate again. 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. There are only 505 billion mobiles in the world. If they all have internet addresses, it would exhaust instantly the IP version 4 address space. So 16 years later, not only did we run out of IP version 4 address space, but we're also now absolutely compelled to implement the new one so we can continue to grow the network. If we don't implement what will happen is that the version 4 address space will exhaust. People will not be able to get on the internet because they won't have addresses to be. And at that point, the internet stopped growing. If I had known in 1973 what was going to happen in 2013, I would have insisted on a much larger address space so we wouldn't have to go through this transition. On June 6th this year, we are all, Google and others on the internet, are going to turn on in And that is the launch of the new larger community. Okay, great. So if you can just go back to the presentation. Uh, that there, everyone, I'm sure you would have recognized him. That's Vin Cerf, the father of the internet, and straight from the horse's mouth. You heard exactly 
how we have come to the situation of you're speaking about a transition. But just to break down some of the things that we had seen, uh, next slide. Next slide, great. Uh, so we have heard this already for the day, devices on the internet need unique addresses, numbers to be reachable to each other. Humans remember names, remember letters, but the devices themselves, they communicate to each other through numbers. And with the numbers, we have an allocation of address space that comes from the IANA. And this allocation goes to the five RIRs via global policy um, determined between the RIRs and the IANA. Um, the allocation space in that instance is uh, slash eight space, which is roughly 16 million uh, addresses. And then each RIR is responsible for the further distribution of these addresses via policies that they develop within their communities. So LACNIC has a policy development process, and I think some of you all may have heard me speak about that earlier if you were in the room. But basically, anyone in the community that has an interest in internet number resources and its administration can participate in one of the open policy forums that we have, or even the policy lists, and either make recommendations or suggestions on how they would like to see internet numbers distributed. Uh, so that allocation actually occurs hierarchically, right? So from the IANA to LACNIC, LACNIC to its customers, which in the most part, for the most part, will deal with the ISPs. Next slide. Great. So in terms of the old protocol IPv4, uh, they are 32 bit long and there were approximately about 4.3 billion addresses uh, when the internet was thought up. But as Vint Cerf mentioned, the internet back in the 70s was just really a project. It was a project that was commissioned by the US Defense Agency. So the idea that we will have or at least we will need all of these addresses didn't really occur to any great extent until later on in the 90s when we started looking at the widespread commercialization of the internet. So this issue was not only within a research, a university research community, it actually went much further than that. Uh, so of that 4.3 billion, the world's population is about 6 billion, connected population is about 3 billion, and what you would have seen over the years is that we have moved in the developing world from a one-to-many scenario. The one-to-many refers to mapping of technology to people. So one technology, well, one source to many, to a many-to-one scenario. And the many-to-one scenario means that little by little, each one of us require more than one IP address because we have a collection of devices whether it's your laptop, it's your smartphone, um, and then there's also another phenomenon, the Internet of Things, where anything can connect to the Internet. So that is the reality that we are in, and in that reality, especially the Internet of Things, it is difficult to be in one point and actually have a full appreciation of what that uh, demand for IP addresses looks like outside of your location. Uh, next point. Next slide. So back to the history. So in the 80s, we were looking at just a research network among uh, universities for about 100 computers. And then again, 1992 is when we had that commercial expansion, that boom. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have remembered uh, AOL as one of those earlier, right? And it was around the 90s as well when the Internet Engineering Task Force realized that with this commercial expansion, uh, we're going to have a problem. We're going to be running out of IPv4 addresses. So it was around uh, the early 90s and 93 that we started seeing it within the IETF, I'm segues in a bit, uh, decisions are made, work is done via a very simple process called the request for comments. And with the request for comments, it's basically engineers putting forward their proposals, uh, uh, which 
Great. I see my presentation is gone for a trip, but that's no problem. I'm sure that it will come back sometime soon. <laughs> it's basically the engineers putting forward their proposals and by a simple acceptance, that becomes the new standard. So the specifications for IPv6 started appearing between 1993 and 1996. And we can actually say between 1996 and 1998, which would be between RFC 1883 and RFC uh, 2460, that's when we really started to have a well-defined uh, new protocol called IPv6, right? And great, next slide. All righty. Yeah. Good. So just as a recap, especially if you just enter the room, uh, allocation from the IANA slash eight blocks. A slash eight block refers to roughly 60 million addresses. That's a global policy between the IANA and the RIRs. And then the RIRs further distribute these resources. And this further distribution is done by a needs-based criteria. The member organizations of the RIRs are those that ask for internet resources, and they demonstrate the particular need that they have. And based on that, they get varying sizes of, in this instance, we're talking about IPv4 uh, addresses. But we'll go back to that just in a little while because there's a precision about LACNIC. Um, so, and then the ISPs, of course, they further assign IP addresses to their customers to the, the terminal points on the network. Next slide. So, exhaustion. This is where we are. What does exhaustion mean? And this is where I begin to speak a bit about LACNIC because when we look at the dates, we saw that in the first instance, APNIC, well, the ANA allocated its last slash eight block in February 2011. And then when you look at the RIR, as you saw in the APNIC region, they were first to run out in that same year, in April of that year. Um, RIPE NCC on the 14th of September 2012. And IRON is expected to run out this year in May and Afrinic in a couple years to come. LACNIC ran out last year on the 10th of June, 2014. So you may ask yourself, why is there this disparity between these uh, exhaustion dates? It, it, it's a reflection of a number of things. It's a reflection of the state of internet development across the regions. And it also looks at the issue that initially, we have to remember the internet was a project. So actually, when we look at that uh, February 2011 date, when the IANA allocated the last slash eight uh, address space, we have to appreciate at that time, the about 42% of all IPv4 uh, address space was actually within the US, right? Later on, it's when we had the commercialization of the internet that this idea of the distribution across the regions and the base criteria and membership policies, those came into effect. But you had a period from before, and there's still some addresses that were retained by the US military that they, that accounts for a lot of the IPv4 addresses that existed before. Uh, next slide. So this is just a graph of the LACNIC situation, and the blue line shows you how over those dates, which are a bit old, that's last year, um, the blue line is what actually happened as opposed to the uh, projections that were made. At slash nine is when it, there would have been a trigger, and then at slash 10 is when we would have entered into our exhaustion phase. So that slash 10 line, is coincides, it looks like the 7th there, but it's really about the 10th of June that we uh, determined that that was the exhaustion point. Uh, next slide. So, we were mentioning this, that is a uh, needs-based criteria. Exhaustion does not mean that we have arrived to zero. This is a different idea of exhaustion. 
Exhaustion means that we are down to the last slash 10 allocation, the last 4 million addresses, IPv4 addresses that can be allocated. So in that instance, uh, what we have in the LACNIC area, yeah, next, um, is that when we come, or when we came, sorry, to the slash 10, um, the last allocation, uh, we enter into a two-tiered phase. And this is where I make that distinction between the LACNIC region, because if you remember a couple of slides back, the Aran region hadn't reached exhaustion as yet. So the LACNIC region is a bit ahead in terms of uh, what it has actually put into practice and what the community decided uh, what it wanted to do within the exhaustion phase. So in this exhaustion phase, we have a two-tier uh, approach. In the first tier, we call it soft landing. And then in the second tier, we have resources for new entrants. And then we'll come to the final exhaustion point eventually. Okay. But with soft landing, resources for new entrants in this exhaustion phase, whereas before we are speaking about allocations being done on a needs based criteria, at this point in time, all of that has shifted. What happens now is that we are going with a fixed allocation size, and that size is a slash 22 uh, allocation size, which is roughly about 1,024 addresses. Next slide. So, soft landing. Soft landing means for the first uh, 2 million of our remaining 4 million, we are going to give every, well, new or existing organizations they can get a slash 22, 124 addresses every six months if properly justified, right? So every six months, not before that. So the six months refer to the time that you enter the ticketing system, to the time that your resources are allocated. And you can only get 1,024 addresses every six months. But on the other hand, after we have finished that first slash 11 or that, that first 2 million, when we come to the last 2 million, next slide, we enter the new entrance phase. And the new entrance phase is really where we say for the last 2 million, only new organizations will be able to request a slash 22 address space, 1,024 addresses once. So at that point in time, as an organization, you have to really consider what it is you are requiring IP, um, internet numbers for. Uh, so it's really a, a way of encouraging at least new organizations, new networks to make the switch. But at the same time, there's always a need for IPv4 if you're talking about regression networks and the like, but we won't go into that um, too much right now. I think we could save that for the discussion afterwards. Next. Uh, next direction. Next direction. You know, continue that way. Great. I no back. <laughs> yeah. Here comes IPv6. So IPv6 is supposed to attend to all our needs in the foreseeable future because we are looking at address space which is two to the one twenty eighth power. It is 340 trillion, trillion, trillion. So if we were to look at a similar ratio, I'll give you an analogy, and it's an analogy off of one of Cisco's uh, websites, which speaks to all of IPv4 addresses fitting in the size of a golf ball and all of IPv6 addresses fitting in the size of the sun. So it's really not expected to run out anytime soon. It's a huge improvement. But I would say that probably one of the difficulties um, with this process, and we'll probably speak about that a bit more the, when the panel starts, is that IPv6 wasn't reverse compatible. So it's almost as if you are replacing a protocol with the internet entirely with another protocol in the internet, and now there's this kind of period where we're looking at transition and we're looking at confusion and a lot of things happen. So why isn't it done already? Uh, a long story, and the long story, uh, for the most part, um, may not actually deal with the technical argument. I mean, obviously, 
we want the internet to continue growing. Obviously, we are looking for the expansion, development, there are new devices being connected, there are new users. So it's not necessarily the technical arguments, but there's so many different cases that occur. One of them that we have seen quite often in the Latinx region is a question of transition costs. So quite often you'll find in organizations that the technical people can very much understand the need for IPv6, but they aren't able to rationalize it before their financial heads. And at times we have seen in some places that they will say, no, let's probably just invest in uh, a translation mechanism, uh, a transition mechanism, uh, a carrier grade NAT, and see how that goes. But again, I won't go in much into that because for the purpose of time, we will probably save that for the debate. But the status quo has been broken, IPv6 is being deployed, and we will see a bit about how it's being deployed. So next slide. The how comes with this example, <laughs> World IPv6 Day. World IPv6 Day is basically where you have uh, the Internet Society and encourage all of the uh, content distribution networks, all of the information intermediaries to test IPv6. And it was a test and it was done and a lot of publicity was done around it and it lasted for a complete 24 hours on the 12th of January 2011. And it was quite successful then that later on we decided, okay, let's do it again, but for real this time. And for real this time was the idea that you actually turn on IPv6 permanently. So when I said CDNs, the content distribution networks, next slide, we are really looking at those actors in the internet, those intermediaries such as Google, Facebook, Yahoo, um, a lot of those major CDNs were the ones who would have deployed IPv6 then. Uh, of course, there are some ac access providers within the US, Comcast, T-Mobile, and within the Latin American region in particular, Telefonica Peru had taken the step. Um, and it's significant as well because it's the, the industry uh, that took the step to make that switch or have an IPv6 deployment. Uh, next. All right, so this again, it was a snapshot of what IPv6 traffic at a global level looked like. We probably move ahead, yeah. And I wanted to make sure that you saw this slide because this slide is very important to have an idea in terms of who is acting so some of the challenges, especially for ISPs in small countries, are always the financial challenges. And I think earlier on when Bevel was talking about the security issues and having business continuity planning, it, it's sometimes a bit difficult to see that far ahead. So why I put this up is that the thrust or the move for IPv6, it comes from different instigators, different agents, provocateurs, right? And in this case, within the Latin American region, we see that there are quite a number of universities and universities and ISOC chapters that have decided to make an event about IPv6 deployment. So we have the examples here of Mexico, Venezuela, DOMREP. Um, they all had a university thrust. Uh, Argentina and Peru, they had collaborations between university and ISOC chapters. Costa Rica was the ISOC chapter. And they really decided that, hey, we need to raise awareness about this. We need to do something about this. And therefore, we are going to be the ones to sort of give that push on IPv6. There are other instances. So, for instance, in Japan, Japan had an entirely different thing where it was the Japanese government that decided we are going to be the most IT advanced nation in the world. So here is a government push uh, that decided that, you know, as part of our strategy in terms of how we are going to be competitive and attractive, we are going to ensure that there's a huge deployment of IPv6. There are, certain, there are other circumstances that allow for that. If you recall in the APNIC region, to begin with, there wasn't a lot of IPv4 addresses to start compared to the others. So they were closer to that, but the thrust of the Japanese government meant with their e-Japan plan that you had incentives for providers to actually adopt and deploy IPv6. You had 
uh, as well in Japan, some very large consumer markets. It's the home of Sony. And some of those conditions provided for that instance, along with the government's insistence that you have a huge uh, IPv6 deployment. So those conditions are important to visualize a bit, and it can probably make you think of your own environment in terms of who will be the movers and shakers if we were to look at this uh, cohesively. Next slide. So uh, we're coming up to a wrap of my presentation. It's a bit faint, but what I wanted to put there, and probably on the next slide as well, if you go to the next slide, is that there are a number of resources that we can use within the LACNIC area to have an idea in terms of what is happening within the LACNIC service area, what tools we can use, what information there is to find out more, and it's a good place to also report what is going on um, locally. Uh, I'm referring specifically to the IPv6 portal that is located on the LACNIC's website. It is an interactive space for you to get as much information as you can, uh, in particular from a regional perspective. One of the things that we encourage with the portal, and in addition to one of our mailing lists, we have an IPv6 mailing list, is the idea that members of the community can actually express some of the challenges that they have been having, some of the concerns, and some of the successes they have been having as well, because we only, it's not just a question of looking at the challenges, it's looking at what actually works. Uh, so global IPv6 traffic, if we were to make a switch, unsuspectingly, we're looking at a huge amount between 15 to 40% of your traffic being run over IPv6. So that means a lot of uh, efficiencies, uh, it's economies of efficiencies when it comes to running NAT. Um, it also is, besides the economy efficiency, you actually see in the long run, it will actually be um, economically uh, efficient to eventually run a significant amount of your traffic over IPv6. Next. So finally, just as a recap, we had exhaustion in the LACNIC area of which the LACNIC Caribbean, as I mentioned before, um, is part of, and that occurred on the 10th of June 2014. Uh, the policies that we have in place right now are somewhat different from what occurred in the past with at least IPv4 addresses. In the past, we're looking at a needs-based system. Now, what we're looking at is a fixed allocation that needs to be justified. And this fixed allocation is done in two phases, well, two parts of the exhaustion phase. In the first part, for the first two million, the soft landing part, new and existing agent uh, entities, they get an allocation of roughly 1,024 addresses once every six months. And then in the very last part, the last 2 million addresses, we are looking at 1 uh, slash 22, also known as 1, 1,024 address space allocation once. And uh, carrier grade NAT um, is not a magic pill. It's not going to solve anything. You can't from a network management perspective, you can't only think about it, about what happens within your community. You have to look, you, you, you don't have sight of what happens beyond that, where people are actually going on the internet. And those are some of the things that will actually affect how you might want to anticipate managing a IPv4 to IPv6 transition. So the, going forward, uh, of course, the rest of the world is deploying it, and we will see that the costs tend to go down as deployment progresses. Um, I'm going to wrap up there. One of the last things I'm going to mention is that here in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the ISPs are actually discussing a bit more about what we can do to tangibly uh, look at IPv6 deployment, and the idea is that eventually you may see some information um, coming out about um, TNT on some very uh, strong initiatives that are currently taking place. But I won't put more information on that. I will just say that, look out for it. It's coming through soon. And of course, that is there to support um, uh, all throughout the way. Thanks very much. And I think now we will probably just... Um, do we have any questions? So when I see no questions, that means that I was actually 
super clear or super confusing. <laughs> Great. Hi, Marlon. Uh, quick question. Right. Yeah. yeah. Quick question. Um, there was some concern about having IPv6 addresses um, transit the internet in, in by way of it conveying host information in the IPv6 header itself. Um, has any? I know there was. Um, I think it was an RFC that proposed randomizing the MAC address portion, the last 64 bits of that address. Um, has any work been done further on that? OK. <laughs> I will tell you quite honestly, uh, you're referring to our, OK. I see Owen here is, has an answer hot off the press for you. So you we'll probably give a yeah, we're, we're streaming, so. So the, almost every major operating system has, for better or worse, implemented what is <laughs> euphemistically called privacy addresses. Um, so the randomization of the last 64 bits is pretty much fait accompli, whether you like it or not. Um, some operating systems allow you to turn it off if you work hard enough at it. Uh, others make it really difficult. Um, it's a mixed bag. The reality is all your host information goes out in your cookies and all of these other wonderful tools that have been used in IPv4 to defeat privacy even beyond the NAT gateway anyway. And all of those still work the same way in IPv6, so I'm not sure you gain anything from the IPv6 privacy addresses, but at least in theory that problem's been solved in IPv6 at the address level, even if not at the other level where it was never solved in IPv4. I came late because I was in another session. Sure. I am not a techie. Mm -hmm. Probably I shouldn't be in here asking this question, but I mm -hmm. use the internet. I have Great. several different pieces of equipment. In 2007, Dev very kindly confirmed for me that in fact what IPv6 was, was a number, a very long number, but a number because IPv6 and IPv4 sounds very confusing for people like me. Okay, so what is two questions? One, I've never been able to understand why the people doing IPv6 didn't at the beginning take a golf ball size piece of IPv6 make the IPv4 addresses link to those addresses, and then it seemed to me that perhaps we wouldn't have quite so much of a problem as we were having at the moment. And the second thing is, what, what, what does it do to me as an end user, or do I just sit back and other people do whatever has to be done and pay whatever has to be paid? Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Dee, for those questions. And actually, they're very relevant questions. Uh, even as you say, you, you know, that it is important not only for techies to understand, but non-techies as well. So part of the issue, uh, Dee, would have been that, uh, and this would have been probably before you came in, the internet in itself, when it was first contemplated, it was just really a private project. It wasn't intended to have the usage that it has right now. But what you saw as well with IPv6 is that there was a lot of learning that went into it, and a lot of things that probably weren't as good in IPv4, um, they were addressed in IPv6. So for instance, you speak about a simplified header, uh, which is good for a network management perspective. You also look at security. You also look at meeting something called the end-to-end -end principle, networking principle, again, um, in a true sense because of this unlimited number of addresses that you have available. And with that, you can anticipate that this will affect, for instance, the quality of service that you can have. It can affect as well. It can actually bolster cybersecurity. 
initiatives. We had seen as well um, an example with uh, the China Next Generation Internet Initiative, where they had a two-phased approach to employ that initiative, but the long and short of it was that for the Olympic Games in Beijing, they had a very robust and almost novel uh, security uh, set up in place, which dealt with sensors and, again, uh, uh, well, basically the, the security setup was uh, quite sophisticated compared to what anyone had seen or anyone could have established before. So that is probably what I would say uh, the learnings that came from IPv4, so IPv4 when it was created, security wasn't necessarily an issue. The parameters have changed significantly. And I think now, even when we speak about IPv6 and how we're managing IPv6, we have to free our minds of those old parameters and try and think of a greater range of possibilities that we're actually facing. So it, it, it's not backward compatible, so it's not that you know you can easily just use one or the other, the, that's where we come into the transition mechanisms and that's where it gets a bit murky. But um, the idea is that with this new and improved uh, protocol, we're really seeing the true uh, evolution of the internet architecture as it was. When I was born, I was given the name Deirdre and my father's surname was Dugan, so my name was Deirdre Dugan. Later on in life, I married somebody called Williams. So Deirdre Dugan became Deirdre Williams. My passport was able to be changed from Deirdre Dugan to Deirdre Williams. Um, there were some glitches along the way because people didn't write things down properly, but still, you could make an association between one name and another name, and the second name works. Why can't that work with IPv4 and IPv6? Okay, our, I think Owen here has <laughs> something you like so, to add. So the main reason that it doesn't work in the case of IPv4 versus IPv6 like it does in your passport is because in your passport there were enough characters available in the field to hold Williams or Dugan. You didn't run out of room. In an, IP, in an, in an IPv4 packet, you have a fixed four octets to put the destination address in and a fixed four octets to put the source address in. So if you want to talk to, from a v4 only server or a v4 only host to a v6 only host, you somehow need to squeeze the 128 bits of address that don't correspond to a v4 address of that other host into that 32-bit field. It doesn't fit. In order to make it fit, you have to change all the software on the v4 only host. Well, if you're changing all the software on the v4 only host, you might as well put v6 on it. <laughs> And that's why it wasn't made backwards compatible because there's no backwards compatible way to put 128 bits of address in a 32-bit field. Okay. Um, I'm looking forward to the Internet of Things. And as a future consumer of the Internet of Things, I expect to have a lot of things. And... Uh, I expect I'll, I'll get some uh, IPv6 addresses for them. I'd like to know what, what would what would my process for, for getting those addresses be, and then uh, you know, say I assign some some of these addresses to some of my things that I have around the house, and then I I drive them across town and I'm on another network. Um, how how do those things still remain uh, accessible to the internet? Uh, the last part of your question, I I didn't get that part. Um, quite clearly. Uh, I, I guess my question is, you know, what's the... If you physically transport, um, basically you, you, change the, you change the connection of, you know, this, this, this my wired Coca-Cola bottle, um, if, I, if I physically transport it somewhere else, so it's on a different network, and it, it uh, it needs to connect, but it's still, I want to identify it as this, as this specific thing. I mean, what's, what's the protocol that, 
You know, this somehow identifies itself as um, having this address and then that, that identification uh, somehow makes it through a system so that uh, my refrigerator at home can make contact with my Coke bottle. So uh, I would say in the first instance, you could appreciate under an IPv6 scenario that you actually have a specific IP address that will be for your refrigerator and another one for your car or another one for any other item uh, within your house. As it stands right now with IPv4, uh, a lot of times, because again, we are talking about transition mechanisms, you actually have an IP address that hides within a network. So it makes it a bit difficult to pinpoint specifically which device within that network is actually using an IPv6. So I don't know if that probably gives a bit more uh, of a, an explanation for what you're looking for, the Internet of Things, but um, I'm, I'm sure that, okay. <laughs> I can take a stop of it. In theory, what you're asking for is it will, will work. Um, with IPv6, you'll be able to give your fridge, your car, uh, unique address that's unique for the entire internet, unlike now in which essentially hide behind a, a NAT router. Okay, so that will work. However, the second part of your question in which you want to roam all over the world, it will work probably if, you, if you're able to reconnect probably to the same ISP that have the same addressing scheme as was assigned to it. But once you move beyond uh, to a different ISP that may have a different IP allocation, then you won't have the same unique IP address. However, there are ways to get around that. You can have the device re-register oh, with a different IP address. It will still be your same unique device and still have access to the same resources, but this actual IP address will, will change. And that, in some cases, don't not be important. Uh, that makes sense. It's, that's true. I, I did have a first question, which would be, how, how would I get these addresses as a consumer? Great. Uh, um, as a consumer, um, if you're within the LACNIC service region, of course, you can go onto our website and we have it very uh, clearly uh, spelled out how you can actually access uh, addresses. Um, it explains what the criteria are. It explains what the ticketing system is. And of course, once you're able to meet those criteria, um, you go through the process. It's an online application, and of course, uh, at any point in time, uh, you can also get assistance from someone in case there are any uh, hiccups along the way. So uh, my uh, LACNIC's website, of course, is lacnic.net. Uh, underneath there, you see we have a specific session that deals with resources, and under resources, you'll be able to get all the information you need, identify yourself in terms of what type of uh, entity uh, you may be, whether it is you're know, going as an ISP or a uh, university, etc. And of course, from there, uh, the particular needs that you need to meet. So once those criteria are met, it's, it's easy as pie. Yeah, that, that answers the question of how an ISP gets resources or how a relatively large or multi-homed organization gets resources. You're, I believe, asking as a consumer in a household, how do I get those addresses? The answer is most likely your provider will, through a process called Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol Prefix Delegation, which is a new feature in DHCP for v6, uh, provide you a prefix, ideally a slash 48. Some providers are giving smaller allocations. Some providers are even sticking it with a single network of a slash 64, but you, you should scream a lot if they give you a 64, scream a little uh, about wanting your 48 if they give you a 56. Um, but you should get those addresses automatically, basically, through an automated process. And then your devices should automatically, within your network, address themselves uh, as well. Yeah. So it should all be pretty much automatic. Um, there is an additional process called mobile IPv6, where your Coke bottle could actually create a tunnel back to your house and still be reachable via its same original address within your house but that gets rather complicated and it's a not well solved problem yet. But there is development ongoing. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much. And
before I leave the podium, um, there are a couple of uh, handouts uh, giving you just a very high level information on IPv6 and what we're doing in the LACNIC region on the tables around you. Thanks. All right, uh, we're now going to move on to our final session of the day, which is uh, a panel called IPv6 Success Stories, Network Operators Tell All. So I'd like to invite Levin Cole uh, from Columbus Communications Trinidad, as well as Owen DeLong, and um, Marvin Thomas from Digicel Trinidad and Tobago to join us on stage here. I'll have uh, Levin give his opening remarks to kick us off. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my brief presentation today is on the IPv6 business case and challenges that we've seen um, at Columbus. So I'll go through some of the benefits as well as um, the incentives that we have seen as to why we're deploying IPv6. Next slide, please. Okay. Many companies, they see IPv6 um, as an expense because there is no significant um, benefit to the bottom line, it could have costs incurred, um, especially if you're looking at time, resources, um, training, perhaps software upgrades, equipment upgrades, and maybe you even need to switch your, your service provider. So with all these costs that are involved in, in deploying IPv6, what is the incentive for a business? You'll often hear phrases like, IPv4, it works fine for me. Or most of the internet is still on IPv4 and I don't have a pressing driver to deploy IPv6. How do I justify that CapEx spent to management that says um, IPv6 is necessary? Depending on the business sector, whether it's you know enterprise or service provider or telecoms, this is a valid concern. However, equally important is what is the cost of not deploying IPv6 or what is the cost of maintaining an IPv4 only network? What is the cost of waiting until maybe it's too late or just implementing a workaround such as um, CGN or some translation technology. There are several benefits, however, where you can deploy IPv6 and still see minimal costs and a return on your investment. Firstly, it increases performance and improves network efficiency. What do I mean by that? IPv6, by its end-to-end -end principle removes the NAT layer entirely. The hierarchical addressing structure allows for better planning and aggregation. Therefore, you'll have smaller routing tables, um, smaller headers, less routing overhead, and optimizing a more efficient network. By having improved performance, this also brings a better user experience. The Caribbean is a major content consumer, especially in the area of video and streaming media content. With content providers like YouTube, Facebook, Microsoft, and Netflix already on IPv6, and CDN, CDNs such as Akamai already on IPv6, this provides an opportunity for IPv6 to be a reason to boost ISP adoption. A lot of times people have been saying, I can't get any IPv6 content, but that's no longer the case. There is content out there that's already on IPv6. 
smart devices are becoming more popular. We have the tablet revolution. Everyone has a smartphone these days. And these users are requiring a more connected environment. Also, as the gentleman mentioned, the Internet of Things. Everyone is waiting for the Internet of Things to come. And that requires a lot of IP addresses. IPv4 um, would not be able to suffice. And IPv6 is seen as the platform to ensure connectivity for all these devices, like your fridge and your car, as mentioned before. As a service provider and a transit provider throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, we at Columbus have seen considerable growth over the past decade. As Kevin Smith mentioned, um, Blacknik is already in phase two depletion, and that means we can only get up to a slash 22 at this point. We still have to continue to grow and scale for the future. IPv6 is seen as a way of ensuring business continuity and is quickly becoming a mandate. Also, by dual stacking and, and doing native IPv6, this inherently acts as a form of redundancy should there be a disaster on your IPv4 network. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Challenges and lessons learned. One of the challenges with IPv6 is how to effectively manage such a large address space. This is also an advantage, and it's an opportunity to start fresh and develop a structured addressing plan to streamline deployment. No more spreadsheets. We've invested in a regional IPAM solution, and this allows you to have your address space um, visible and easily managed for very large blocks, up to uh, slash eights even. Um, if you were to try to do that in an Excel spreadsheet, you would quickly run out of rows. Um, also, we did an audit on every single device on the network, and this was done to ensure that everything is IPv6 compatible and also identify gaps in your applications, such as billing, provisioning, or network monitoring tools. For some companies, there are required upgrades and replacements, but this would be minimal since in recent years, um, large vendors such as Cisco and Juniper have been shipping with IPv6 already supported or turned on. Even the latest Microsoft laptops already have IPv6 enabled. We've also made it an obligation that any new gear that is purchased from this point onward must be IPv6 capable. We also went through um, a regional training session on IPv6 to improve our engineer skill sets. And um, Mr. Owen, the long hair, he was one of our trainers who conducted some sessions with us, a fellow panelist. Um, so that is in itself a cost, but a benefit, because you do not want to deploy IPv6 and then you have a network that you're not sure exactly what's running on it. And training is very important in, in getting your engineers and operators up to standard. Security requires a mindset and not a protocol. Um, as the moderator Chris Gunderman has written and explained in one of his um, presentations, IPv6 myths and reality, IPv6 is not somehow um, designed to be more secure. It's not inherently better than IPv4 in terms of security because of IPsec or because it's just a large address range or too big to scan. Um, the same precautions that you take with your IPv4 network in terms of firewalls and access lists, updating your COP policy, your protect RE policies, will ensure that you protect yourself from hackers and vulnerabilities. IPv6 will still be susceptible to a lot of the um, vulnerabilities that you do see in IPv4, and not because you have a firewall and you, you have a IPv4 policy means that it will protect against the same thing for IPv6. That has to be done um, on purpose. 
So your greatest weakness is to turn on IPv6 and not be prepared for if someone tries to attack you. Columbus has also designed an internal IPv6 lab, and this is with the, the sole purpose of testing. We've done extensive testing on the IPv6 features in a simulated environment. Um, before we go and roll it out to our core networks, we want to ensure there's an emphasis on testing and guaranteeing that there is a seamless transition. Because your IPv4 network is running, it has customers on it, and it's not going to go away entirely because you deploy IPv6. You do want to do a migration that will be seamless and non-disruptive to IPv4 at the same time. So in conclusion, um, the majority of the internet and the applications will be on IPv6 in the near future. And as operators, trans, as operation, operators transition to their networks to IPv6, you also need to maintain IPv4 connectivity as well. Um, there was a quote I read online once that said, the greatest flaw with IPv6 is that it's not backward compatible. So you have to start over entirely, and one of the best ways to do that is dual stacking. IPv6 is not perfect, and it will continue to have some growing pains, but the functionality and the development of the internet depends on it. As an investment in the future, it is well worth it. Thank you. Uh, hi, yeah. David Antelan saying, quick question. Um, so, okay, as IPv6 is, becomes more and more deployed, what exactly happens to the IPv4 as the I presume would fall out of use and so forth. Is it going to be recovered or is it, what happens to those uh, IPv4 addresses as IPv6? Or is it just going to be simply turned off? Okay. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, from recent projections, IPv4 is not going to go away overnight. Um, even if we turn on IPv6 and everyone starts using it, there are going to be some slow adopters and, and some sites that may take some time. So what you see people doing is dual stacking where you maintain both your IPv4 and your IPv6 or providing some form of um, translation technology so that if you have a V6 only network, um, you can still be able to reach back into V4 content. I think the only thing is the use may decline because you can't get any more but it's not going to go away entirely, at least not anytime soon. There's a separate question. Well, let me, let me, so, so I think we're looking at at least about five years before we start to even consider deprecating IPv6, and then I don't think that it's going to get formally deprecated so much as slowly die of attrition. And just to kind of pile on that, as, as one second, is that there's a lot of other protocols that are even older that still hang around, right? Technology has a way of kind of living forever. And whether it's in common use or not really is the question. And I think that's, that's so, I think IPv4 will be around for a long time. I think there'll be uh, addresses available again, as Owen said, probably, you know, in the next 10, 15 years as it starts to decline, it won't be an issue anymore. But. Um, if you want custom flow, what can I get the IPv6 address? Okay, are you a cable modem or business customer? Uh, cable modem. Okay, we haven't reached the cable modems as yet, um, but <laughs> <laughs> shortly, later this year, we'll get to that. Maybe next month? Next month? Okay. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> We're pushing on it. I have a, I'm a firewall, 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 I have a firewall there, I'm a router. I want a well, in the meantime, you can get a uh, free tunnel. Yeah, I'm talking about, you know, Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, what's the IPv6 equivalent of the 192.168 You get a large bucket of sand and you stick your head in there. Um, 
No, it's called Unique Local Address. It's uh, FD00 slash eight. Um, yeah, um, there's, there's and, and you basically pick the remainder of a, a, a 40 bits um, at random and, and that gives you your slash 48 of unroutable IPv6 addresses. But the reality is nobody has yet presented me with a use case where I thought it was better to use ULA than just get global unit addresses and use those instead. Uh, it's colon colon one slash 128. Right. Looks like we've got slides here. So please uh, take, the, take the helm, Marvin. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Marvin Thomas, IP engineer, representing Digicel this evening. Um, so what I'm going to speak about is actually ISPs bridging the gap with IPv6 technologies. So if we could go to the next slide. All right, so what are the challenges Digicel actually encountered actually deploying this IPv6 technology, right? Um, the first, well, the first thing we actually noticed during implementation is that not all applications and websites are compatible with IPv6 or actually IPv6 ready. That was actually one of the main things. So while we were doing testing and actually configuring within our core, and we started doing some test scenarios, et cetera, we noticed even though we do some sort of transition, so like if we do NAT64 transition, we could actually access websites, et cetera. But some applications break, for example, Skype and Tango. Some of those um, applications don't work with um, that mechanism trying to bridge the gap between the IPv6 and IPv4 technologies, right? Um, one survey of IPv6 readiness in a market shows approximately 85% of applications being IPv6 capable while approximately 15% field using native IPv6 services only. So this would be just IPv6 um, and no IPv4 services, just IPv6. We can't use certain applications. Next slide. So how do we overcome this? One method overcoming this scenario or hurdle is the dual stacking method. So if as an ISP, Digicel gives you a connection that is IPv6 capable, what we can do is we can give you an IPv6 address along with an IPv4 address, right? That is something that can bridge the gap with some applications or some websites that are not IPv4 compatible, right? So if you're on the IPv6 platform, you still have that IPv4 technology that you could feel back over or go back to, right? But for an ISP, it's not scalable because if you're actually running out of IPv6, right. right, and we give you both an IPv6 and an IPv4 address, it defeats the whole purpose, right? Um, next slide. Back one. Okay, so carry nut, right? That is actually uh, a method that we can actually get around. So we still give you an IPv6 address, right? But within the ISP core, there will still be some sort of carrier grade not happening, right? So in essence, you get an IPv6 address, but you need some sort of communication to still connect or communicate with IPv4 applications or websites, right? This very carrier not comes into play. So we could actually issue or within the core side do a 444 transition. Here, which uh, within this method, we give you a private IPv4 address, right? And it's actually not the public IPv4 address within our core, right? So we will probably have like Hundreds of customers actually not into one address or a block of addresses. Next slide. 
So this diagram here actually illustrates um, how carrier grade NAT actually works within an ISP core, right? Um, so the CPE, right? We have a CPE at the customer's premise, right? So on, on the bottom side or the bottom of the diagram, right? The cell gives you a CPE. Within the core now, there's going to be um, public IPv4 addresses within a specific pool, etc., right, that is going to sit in the CGN appliance. Within the CGN appliance now, that pool now is going to serve many customers, or one to many um, service. And then now it's going to route you out to the IPv4 internet. And that is actually one of the mechanisms that we actually use or can use as an ISP to bridge the gap with um, some applications or websites or content that is not able to communicate via the IPv6 mechanism solely. Right, next slide. So another version is the stack light. So I actually explained to you guys just now to your stack right? Now, dual stack light is something a little bit different from dual stacking, which um, within this RFC, right, it actually creates a tunnel between the carrier or CGN appliance, right, and that now creates a tunnel that encapsulates your IPv6 traffic. So within a DS light solution, right, the customer now gets solely an IPv6 address. Right, you don't get both services to try to bridge the gap. That is solely within the ISP core, right? And it's actually encapsulated within a tunnel now, so that if you need to access, let's just say IPv4 content, right? It triggers that tunnel now to give you that IPv4 service as a customer. Next slide. So the illustration here actually shows how um, that the service actually works, right? So for IPv6 content, you will be going directly to the IPv6 source or destination, I would say, right? That is going to be natively routed to the IPv6 destination, and it has nothing to do with IPv4 or anything like that. But for the... IPv4 side is when the tunnel actually is initiated. So if you need to reach or you need to get to IPv4 content, right, is initiate that tunnel between the CGN and the DSI client, which is going to be the CPE within the diagram here, right? And now when you have to actually get routed towards IPv4 content, it's going to be routed to the CGN and then forwarded onto the IPv4 content. And that is how the ISP actually bridges the gap or bridges some of the gaps with the IPv6 technology currently. Next slide. So based on that, does anyone have any questions or concerns with how ISP actually bridges the gap with the IPv6 technology to date? I guess um, I was wondering about full dual stack. Is there any scenario that you would share exploring that option? Where you have to try 6 or 6K, you'll go to the board. Is that going to be a Well, it, it, it is going to be a consideration, but it's mostly going to be a consideration for corporate customers. So, so residential customers, I, I don't think um, it's going to be scalable for us to implement that for. A residential customer broadband solution, but for corporate customers that have dedicated internet services, that's going to be the solution. You treat me like customers back. How is that? So? <laughs> um, but, you know, there are some customers who want full uh, IPv6 for their transmission, and they have applications that they use as well. Mm -hmm. And you break to your transmission. Well, when they say break through the transition, yeah, if you, in this case, in the light case, where you, mm -hmm. you have three, six. Um, um, right. Going to mm -hmm. uh, right. Suppose that what, the application that the customer wants to use, they, 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 they Right. So on the 
um, on the client side that is transparent to the customer. You well, some applications will not like it. It is transparent, yes, but uh, mm -hmm. they, they want to get all the service that they want to access is a poor access. Right. Poor, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a translation. And the app, what about application engine doesn't, doesn't play well with the app. Right. So, so I, I think there's somewhat a misconception there. Yeah. So that trigger or that tunnel or encapsulation happens everything on the ISP equipment, right? So within the ISP equipment from the CP to the core, right? That happens within our network. So essentially is that we make the magic happen. You, the customer, right? No. So, 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 so far testing, we have, we have a, a lot of customers using the service right now, and they have no issues. So you can provide IPv6 right now. Yeah, native, your, na you, your, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so right now you can get a native IPv6 service, and you can do whatever you please with it. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else has any other questions? I just wanted to clarify that in all of these proposals, the translation is all on the V4 side. And on V4, you're most likely dealing with translation already. So if your applications are going to break, they're probably already broken. If they, you're assuming that um, they, yes, they are not. And you're going to a NAT and you're coming to the next translation. Sometimes going to two NATs may be a problem with some of application. So, yeah, that could be a scenario which that creates. So, so, it's not always, I don't think it's always guaranteed that it will always work in every case. Okay? And you may have one NAT and it survives, then go to two, three NATs and it's, it's a smooth wire. You're right, IPv4 is going to just keep getting worse, film at 11. But, I think the, the benefit also with this is that as the network continues evolving, the internet continues evolving, there'll be more IPv6 content. So the, the plan or the strategy is that you're going to start using more IPv6 content, more websites, more applications are going to transition towards the IPv6 platform and the need for that DSLI function is going to start minimizing. So like, for you to start accessing um, IPv4 um, content, that type of traffic, ISPs are going to see that type of traffic diminishing and the IPv6 traffic is going to increase. So it's a measure there just to, how we would say, reach to the older part of the house. It's like the bridge that connects the older part of the house. But as renovation continues and you continue expanding, you'll, conti you'll just move into that new house and the older portion of your house will be no more. So that's, that's just an example, just to clarify things. That's it? Okay. Thanks, Robert. Owen, Vaughn will be the final speaker on uh, this, and then we'll open up the questions for the whole panel. So I'm going to not bore you with slides, um, and I'm going to be very, very brief. The most important thing about your IPv6 transition process is to start it. Um, the longer you wait, how, how many people here have networks which are shrinking? Nobody. Okay. So this applies universally. The longer you wait, the harder it is, because if your network is not shrinking, it is most likely growing. And the sooner you do your transition process, the fewer devices you have to worry about transitioning. The sooner you start, the sooner you can put policies in place that stop buying IPv4 only applications, services, equipment, et cetera, and you start making sure everything is IPv6 compliant, IPv6 compatible, IPv6 ready, the sooner you stop adding things to your network that you're going to have to fix later. Um, to put this in perspective, I know of a, a bookseller that is still IPv4 only to this day, 
They're a relatively large bookseller. They sell a lot of other things too. They're uh, based in Seattle, Washington. Many of you have probably heard of them. And about five years ago, I was talking to them about why they weren't start their transition to IPv6 right away. And they said, because it'll cost us over a million dollars. And that's just too much. And I talked to them a couple of years ago and they said, well, because it'll cost us more than $10 million, then that's just too much. So I guess they're waiting till it's $100 million or something, I don't know. But start now, you'll be much better off. Thank you. All right, great. Um, so we have a, an esteemed panel of, of experts on IPv6 here. I'd be happy to field any other questions. Um, I have a couple myself. The, the first one, um, mostly for, for Levin and Marvin, um, who are at least starting to deploy IPv6 in your networks. I, what I've heard told is um, for ISPs, one of the best ways to deploy it is, is inside out, right? Start with the backbone, which is the easy part, and then move out towards the, uh, towards the edge, towards the customers, which tends to be more complicated and more devices. Um, and for content providers, uh, it's usually easier to start at the edge, right? So just change over your website and then move backwards and move inwards. Um, the only thing aside from that that, made, that that I wanted to call out and ask you guys about was in, in troubleshooting and engineering your network, right? So now that you have a portion of your network that's IPv6 enabled, uh, have you also enabled IPv6 inside of your own corporate network, right? So for the, for the network operations center, the engineering teams, so they can actually reach the IPv6 devices over IPv6? Or is that a consideration or, or any thoughts? Um, it's, it's definitely a consideration, but um, we're still in the planning phases with regards to that. And we, we should reach there probably by the end of the year, right? For our NOx and our internal infrastructure as in data center management, etc. We should be there by the end of the year. Okay. Um, for the first question, I think we have taken um, a top-down approach where we started at the edge, um, your BGP pairs, your upstream providers, um, and work our way down to the access layer, the access layer being the hardest layer because that's where you may have to do some CPE swap outs, um, uh, cable modem upgrades and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the approach we've been taking, working our way from the top down. Um, to the second question, the enterprise, no, we haven't. Um, because that's not where the main driver is at this time. Um, with before depletion, the main driver has been to continue to sell services, to continue to grow, and um, the business will focus on that, and we'll get to the enterprise shortly. Sure. Okay. No, not as good. So how do they manage the V6 devices? Management has still remained V4. But V6 has been for your customers. How do you monitor V6? <laughs> the monitoring systems will be V6. Oh. Yeah. I thought you meant like the PCs. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, another thing that, that was mentioned um, was you know the lack of obviously not everything out there, right? Not not everything out there is IPv6 capable yet. So, so there are some websites your customers are reaching that are V4 only. Um, there's probably some, some other things out there. Do you, are you doing any outreach with partners or vendors? Is there any requirements? I know, Levin, you said everything you're purchasing now is IPv6 capable. Um, is, there, is there any other actions that, that ISPs could take to try and push content providers that are maybe partners or, or anything like that? Any, any thoughts on, because you know, I think the purchasing requirement's a very good idea, right? That's the first, first step. Are there, are there other steps past that? Um. I think another step would be to partner with um, a lot of the content providers. Um, we have partnerships with uh, like Akamai and Google, and they have been very ahead of the game and, and forward thinking in terms of IPv6. So partnerships with those providers and content providers is one of the aspects we love. Um, from Digital Zen, I think um, the push will be more so on the customers. We will try to get a lot more customers using the IPv6 service. And once we start to get a lot more customers, it would somewhat force 
some of the content providers that actually in um, adopt an IPv6 platform. So I think digital, from a digital perspective, we will be pushing on customers to actually take the IPv6 service. And I think that will put more pressure on the content players to get IPv6 ready. Um, just to add to that, and I don't really mean to speak in their place, but uh, at this point in time, uh, LACNIC is also working a bit with the regulator, um, and there's a project where the ISPs in, are involved, and part of it deals with actually identifying some of the actors that you need to reach out to and explain a bit, uh, at least help them understand from the, that side what they uh, demand is what the actual uh, issue is at, at the core. So um, the whole question of, for instance, um, uh, CPEs that has been raised, um, the idea of approaching CDNs as well, that's one of the ideas in the making. And really just, uh, as you said, reaching out to those customers and having them understand what's at stake, because for the most part, um, uh, just saying that, well, I have IPv4, you know, that that's not a feasible uh, approach. So there's that sort of engagement that we're doing. And another type of engagement that we're doing at this point in time is really trying to go from internet community to internet community and find out what some of the needs are for the actual engineers, the actual network admins that are um, having to face this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's a third thing I'll probably um, put on the table right now is that within the LACNIC region as well, we are trying to commission studies that will actually try and document some of those challenges and successes we've been having. And with those studies, we're trying to look at countries within the LACNIC service area that can serve as comparative countries for others. So the idea is that once you have a case documented, uh, the ISPs in other regions, will be, well, in another place, will be able to probably understand that, okay, I had a similar challenge. I could probably contact this person. I could probably see how they approach the particular situation. So that's another thing that we have um, in the making in terms of how we can try and support uh, the internet community in looking at IPv4 to IPv6 transition. So I'm going to put a little bit of a different take on this because I spent much of the last six years doing outreach to various content providers and content networks and ISPs uh, trying to get them to move on IPv6. I think that most of what can be achieved on the content side through outreach has been achieved. I think that the larger content networks are very well aware of IPv6. The ones that are still refusing to do it are making a conscious decision um, to not be part of the future of the internet and you know that's going to make life interesting for some of the rest of us but there's not a lot we can do through outreach to change that. Uh, I wish there were. I wish I was more optimistic about that. Um, the place where I think it's going to next hit the fan that's going to be really important and that we've kind of not paid as much attention to as early as we should have is uh, the consumer electronics sector. Uh, all of these smart TVs and Blu-ray players and TiVos and amplifiers and uh, various other home devices, um, you know, even a lot of the light bulbs and stuff that are coming out now that are Wi-Fi connected are all being developed with IPv4 only. Uh, many of them are being built with WizNet 5100 chipsets in them, which are IPv4 hardwired in hardware Ethernet Wi-Fi chips, um, which makes it even worse. Uh, so I think we really need to make a big push on the consumer electronics side towards IPv6. Um, I don't know who or where to go to push on that, but I think that's where outreach can still make a big difference. Um, on the content side, I think that most of them are starting to move. Um, even Amazon is showing signs of moving, um, though not nearly fast enough. Um, but I don't think there's a lot more to be achieved by investing much more in outreach on the content side. So I think it's time to shift our focus more towards consumer electronics and end user devices. Very good. Uh, on that note, I think you're probably right. And on the consumer electronics side, as far as where to push, right? The Consumer Electronics Association, CEA, is a good place. They actually do have an IPv6 working group that I was a part of for a while. 
um, hasn't been super active and doing much, but it's there and they're at least thinking about it now. So it's a positive step and that may be one place to, to push. Um, also uh, DLNA and, and UPNP organizations that set standards for consumer electronics. They may be very interesting places to put some pressure on for IPv6. Um, a couple of years ago, we added IPv6 requirements to, this, to the next versions of both UPNP and DLNA. So that may be coming, but again, it is, it is lagging. So as, as far as pressure points, those might be a couple. Any other questions uh, for our panel? Please, do you have a microphone? Thank you very much. Um, just recently, I, I'm a Flow customer in St. Lucia, which I, I'm not quite sure whether that means I'm a Flow Wireless customer too or not. <laughs> As a Flow customer, uh, just recently, last autumn, it happened while I was away traveling. Flow installed a new system that presumably they thought was better and they put in a new router and a new box for the television. And I'm wondering whether I can rely on the fact that Flow has given me IPv6 compatibility. Is there a way I can find out myself? Do I need to ask Flow to find out? Could you tell me, please, where I'm at? Because I'm, I'm assured that my computer is probably all right. It probably knows how to do both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't speak much to the St. Lucia business unit. Um, but I can tell you, if the, it's a, a recent modem, um, they may have to do some upgrades throughout the core network to support IPv6, but the CPE itself may be IPv6 capable already. Okay. As to how to tell if you have IPv6 or not already active on your network, uh, the easiest thing is to go to whatismyipv6address.com. And it'll either give you your IPv6 address on your computer or it will tell you you don't have one. Uh, another good site is test-ipv6.com. Yeah. And, and as far as a, a kind of common language question you could possibly ask them was, uh, because if, if you ask them about IPv6, especially at the very, very low level customer service level, they may not know what you're talking about. Um, but if you ask if you have, because it's a cable modem, um, Doxis version 3, Doxis 3.0, and if it's Doxus 3.0 or beyond, it will absolutely have, it's at least capable of doing IPv6 at that point. Doxus, it's a D O C S I S. It's a very long acronym. But yeah, Doxus 3.0. 3.0. Just a quick one. Uh, what is is it? What is my IPv6 address.com? Correct. Thank you. Excellent. Any more questions for the panel? Mike's coming. Sorry, I want to I want to ask a stupid question. Um, I've been starting to hear about dark. It's sort of just starting to permeate, and I just don't know whether it's real or it's not real. Is what you all are doing here and this protect our kids? So the dark internet is as real as any other dark thing in society. Um, basically, it's a, a catch-all term being used to describe criminal activity on the internet. Um, and dark websites are basically websites that you don't notice if you go surfing the regular search engines, but if you know where to look, you can find them and they're where you go to buy your credit card numbers or uh, you know, pay X number of stolen credit cards for a 10 gigabyte DDoS attack against whoever you dislike this week or uh, what have you. Um, they, they're, they're real, they exist, they're out there. Um, you know, they're operated by miscreants and you know, they're like any other black market or uh, what have you, just uh, they've, they've joined the digital age too, and yes, many of them are, are, are dual stacked, and, and they're available on both v4 and v6. In fact, some of them were v6 before anybody else was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
If there aren't any more questions, I'd like to give a chance for everybody to give a closing remark. Perhaps it'd be it'd take just a quick 30 seconds to uh, offer your advice on IPv6 deployment or, or any closing words you might have. I'm going to start at the end of the table. Marvin? Um, I think my closing remarks would be that you just shouldn't be afraid of the technology. I started to realize or notice speaking to some people that they, they are somewhat afraid of the technology, not knowing what it is. Um, but I mean, it, it is what it is. It is new, but it is the future. So I would honestly recommend, and, I, and as an engineer, I would recommend that you actually use the service. Get a feel for the service to know what it is about. Um, see the, how is the address and format. So you get an IP address on your laptop, you check it out. You know, you check the services to see what services you can actually access. And it's not really too much of a bad thing. It's the same internet is internet. And I think we just need to start thinking like that, opposed to thinking IPv6, IPv4. Once we just start thinking that the internet is the internet, we'll all be fine and we'll progress very quickly. I'd like to respond to that. My credit card is fish, and in the space of maybe a day or a few hours, I took $40,000, put $40,000 on my card. Mm -hmm. So you say you use the internet, mm -hmm. and I'm getting more and more concerned about all the bank accounts I have out there. Right. I can't remember, uh, I'm told yes, the mechanisms I can use mm -hmm. to sort of have better security on my account. Right. Passwords. Right. But I have little codes that I try to use. But mm -hmm. One of these days, someone's going to pick up on my code. So, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. and I think uh, we have to report that you know, how do we protect people? Because there are people who will go on unsuspecting right. that everything is hopefully going. Right. Yeah, the first um, online account I opened, it was only after senior manager of my team in public bank, which is the bank here, as you know, right. assured me that it was safe. Mm -hmm. I'm a general manager of IT, and I said, look, I will protect you. I want to know, is this safe? Right. She assured me, and I trust her, that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. I have some accounts now where the security system seems to be pathetic. I just, right. You just put in a first set of accounts. So I think you have to be careful when you say that. No, I, no, 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 I understand where you're coming from, but I think safety is relative, right? Once you're on the internet, you're actually within a domain that can be unknown or known towards the user. I think you just need to take the, the best practices and most preventative measures to actually ensure your safety as an internet user. And that goes for V4 and V6. Yeah. If I can jump in just one second, because that, that's a common thing that comes up, I think, and, and looking at it, it kind of harkens back a little bit to the security panel uh, and some of the things that uh, Bevel said about you know, looking at this from a policy approach and, and actually structuring security. And also um, well, what Levin said about the fact that, that security is not necessarily comes from one technology, it's, it's a mindset. Um, I think we have to take, we seem to be, at least right now, looking at uh, online security much more harshly than we do physical security. Um, the locks on your doors can be, you, in many cases, right, a, a stiff shoulder or, or, a, or a hard kick can, can d d disable the lock. Um, handing your credit card through a fast food window and the guy walks away with it and comes back with it uh, is probably much less secure than typing it in on an online store. So it, that while the security risks are real and need to be addressed, we also need to uh, you know, take, a, take a good look at uh, where all security risks lie, I think. Yeah, and I don't. I, I certainly don't think there's any case where you take on significantly more security risk by going to v6 versus v4 or dual stack versus mono stack v4. It's it, the the security models there are very much the same. It's still a web browser. It's still HTTP um, or HTTPS or what have you. It's still the same level of encryption, et cetera. So I don't. I don't think in terms of moving forward, we need to worry about security being significantly different. Um, the good news is it's not any worse. The bad news is it's not really any better either. Um, but my, uh, my closing remark is primarily just do it, move forward. Um, you know, you, you, the only way you're gonna lose is if you don't try. Um, 
if you if you start moving forward, you're going to very rapidly discover that most of IPv6 is what we uh, have come to refer to as 96 more bits, no magic. Um, it's mainly just like the internet you're used to using, except we have bigger addresses that look funny. Okay. Um, my closing remarks would be similar to what Marvin and, and Owen said. Um, turn on IPv6, but don't just turn it on. Have security as a part of your mindset. And I think the sooner you do it, the cost is actually you know, more beneficial to do it now rather than waiting until everyone else is on, is on IPv6 and, and you're, you're now uh, too late to the game. So I think it's sooner rather than later, but also um, keep security as a mindset and um, you'll be okay. Thank you. Okay. My closing remarks are quite simple um, and they are think big, start small. Think big in that know that the internet is more than what you see around you, is more than your actual country. It's a global medium. And just based on that, we won't be able to actually see how it's developing across the world, but it, it is happening. IPv6 is being deployed. Start small in that it doesn't mean that you have to do a complete switch out of your entire system immediately. You can do a phased approach. You can look at your core. You can take phased approach in terms of how we're going to invest in uh, IPv6 deployment. And of course, at any time, uh, organizations such as LACNIC and ISOC, they're there to help. So many times when you just don't know, it, there's absolutely no, um, no barrier in just reaching out and asking for help. That's it. Great. So you thank the panel. Thanks, guys. And I have just a few brief closing remarks before we uh, all get out of here. Are those slides available? If you go ahead and go to the, the first slide, the next slide. So I first want to thank all of our speakers again. Um, I think we had some really excellent information today. Uh, I know I learned some things, and I've heard already from folks uh, just in the couple of breaks we had that uh, folks learned things. So thank you to all our speakers. And the next slide. Um, thank you also to uh, CTU for, for hosting us here. Being part of this week has been a great honor. So thank you. And uh, on the next slide, we always to thank uh, our sponsor, Affilius. Affilius has signed on to sponsor our ION conference series for the next three years. So through 2017, uh, we have some funding involved to be able to continue these meetings and, uh, and hopefully keep improving them and bring this knowledge to more places and, and uh, around the world and, and more different audiences. Uh, and the last slide, of course, thank all of you. And um, we want to urge you to go to Deploy360, um, the website, as well as uh, creating content. If you have knowledge, we'd love to help you share it. And if you need knowledge, uh, let us know, and we'll try and track it down for you. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, and great day. Have a great night. Oh, yeah. Just a, a quick comment. It, I was trying, and I was saying to Sean uh, a little earlier on, Ion. I was looking all over the, your website and trying to find what I, what I meant, and you know I couldn't find it. Yeah. So it's it's you know you all are trying to communicate here, but immediately you lose a lot of people. You know, okay, people in the know who you don't really need to communicate to. You know, that's not what they need. So it's it's I think it's just something that you know the Internet Society needs to look at sure. and come up with a new name. I know it's going to take a little while to sort of. Um, sit in, but it almost needs a rebranding, if you will. Okay. Okay. Yeah, good advice. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you all for coming.